G'day there. You're watching the Aussie BIM Guru, and welcome to lesson two of my Learn Dynamo series on how to learn Dynamo for Autodesk Revit. So just a quick recap. So we've covered uh, what the series is about and how to manage the interface of Dynamo. Uh, feel free to watch those videos first if you haven't already, um, just to come up to speed. But today our focus is uh, arithmetic, data flow, and logic functions in Dynamo. So learning the basic building blocks of a script. So we're gonna go straight to Dynamo um, to not waste any of your valuable time. So this is the Dynamo interface. I'm currently just in a script in a empty model. So everything we're doing at the moment is only in the Dynamo environment. So you don't have to worry about any, um, any Revit families or anything like that. So you can open an empty project as well. And you can do these functions in any version of Dynamo. Most of these functions have been around um, almost since the beginning. So basically we're gonna be dealing with some functions out of the, 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 the standard nodes that come with Dynamo. We're mostly dealing with nodes that come from input and in math and a couple from a list. So we'll be looking today at things such as uh, some basic input types. Uh, predominantly we're dealing with numbers today. So you can click on one of these to get a number. And this is basically just an output. So as you change this value, it will, it will change the output that's coming out of there. Notice that I'm running in automatic mode, which is why everything's updating on the fly. So as that changes, so will the number as well. It's important to understand the difference between numbers and integers. So a number uh, doesn't have to be a whole number, whereas an integer does. So if you type in a number that is whole, uh, Dynamo will understand that, that it can use this as an, as an integer, uh, but also as a number. However, a number like this could not be used as an output for an integer, and usually it will give you an error if you try to feed this into something expecting an integer. So we'll move on to some basic functions. So we're gonna look first at what we call sliders. So uh, sliders are quite handy. So basically they let you set a minimum, a maximum, and a step or a minimum, a maximum, and a step for a number. So this one's an integer slider. So this one has to be whole numbers. So if I try to make a step of say 5.2, it will just go to zero because it can't accept it. But we can say we have a step of one and basically that gives us just a little slider. And as I change that, you can see my output's also adjusting as well. Likewise, we have number sliders here. Um, so here we've got a step of 0.1, so we can actually end up with numbers instead. So I could pick quite a, quite a strange number or something not very practical. And you can see that I'm going up in steps of that number between the minimum and the, and the maximum in this case. And it will usually pick the, the best fit. So in this case, I can just say, uh, say I did 0.11. So my last value will always be the top of my range. But you can see below that I also still get 0.99. So it fits everything possible as well as the maximum value. So this one I find a bit less useful. I tend to use integer sliders more often in my scripts. And these are good ways to start a script for a user so that they can dynamically change uh, their outputs quite quickly uh, by just dragging these handles. Because you can just condense these down to a, a single row so that you hide all that interface, but it's always sitting there just below this arrow. Okay, so we're gonna look now at operations. Um, so we'll just start off with the basic operations. So obviously these are plus, minus, multiply, divide, and remainder. So I'm just taking the numbers five and three here and feeding them in as inputs to plus. And you can see, depending which function I pick, I get different outcomes. So obviously if I add them, I get eight. If I subtract them, I get two. You can get negatives as well. So if I just disconnect these nodes and I say three, take five, I can get negative two as well. So it does, it does accept all math that would typically work. Um, obviously multiply, it doesn't matter which way you do it. If you divide and it's not a whole number, obviously it will give you a number that's got decimals to round. Um, and if you do remainder, it will basically just give you what's left over from a whole number division. So obviously five divided by three um, leaves a remainder of two because three can only go in once. Um, if this became six, for example, obviously the remainder would be zero. And notice how these all dynamically update because I'm in automatic mode. If you're in manual mode, um, as you change these, nothing will happen until you go manual and run, and then they recalculate all the values. I'll stay in automatic mode. This is usually only okay when you're working with maths because maths is really easy for, easy for Dynamo to calculate. Um, keep in mind that all these functions are actually in uh, the, the nodes here. So for example, you can go into math and find all the functions um, and operators in this case. Uh, but you'll find the more you use functions, the less likely you rely on this library. And the more often you'll just right click and say, go plus and you'll find the plus node, for example. And if you go add, it knows that you're looking for add as well because it searches through the description of what the node does. 
So my, my advice is always to try and get as, as used as possible to actually searching for things this way in Dynamo. However, if you need, you can still use this library. Okay, and we're just gonna quickly look at uh, two nodes here. So one is the absolute value um, or the abs, which basically just ignores a negative number and says, I just wanna know how much I have. So in this case, if I put in a negative number, I end up with a positive number. Um, obviously, if I have a positive number, it's still a positive number. And then this one here is basically just saying, what is the sign of what I have? So if it's negative, it'll give you negative one. If it's zero, it will give you zero. And if it's positive, it'll give you plus one. And then all these things become little tricks that you can use in your script to process values and data. So this is why I'm showing you all these things, because we'll use a lot of these on the fly later in the tutorials. So it's good to understand at a fundamental level what they do. Okay, we've got exponentials as well. So you can obviously raise things to a power and you can also square root as well. So you can see here where we're basically squaring five and then we're square rooting and we're ending back at five or we have 25 when it's squared. Uh, trigonometry, I won't touch base on too much about trigonometry, but you probably know a little bit about it. So basically cos, sine and tan functions are all available in Dynamo and likewise arctan, arccos and arcsine are also available similarly as well. They typically accept angles or ratios um, as their input and their outputs are what you'd expect in that it's a, I guess, a, a ratio or it's a, a angle in this case. Okay, um, so we're gonna look at rounding really quickly. Um, so that, there's some things that people don't know about rounding quite often in Dynamo. Um, obviously there's a round node, which will just round to the nearest uh, number of digits you specify or to the nearest whole number if you just use math round without the digits. So there's two types of rounding nodes um, that you can use, which is a little bit confusing. I might just go and track them down in the library itself just to make it easier. Um, you can check in here as well where certain things are coming from. So I can go round and I can see that it's coming from, uh, in this case, number. So I believe that this comes from math operators. No, it's coming from, see that's what happens when you don't even use this library anymore. You sort of forget where these things belong. It's under function in maths. And you'll see that they're both called round, but one of them has two inputs. So you see these, these, these things in brackets are basically telling you what the likely inputs are gonna be for the script. So you can see that they're almost the same, but one of them is just gonna round you off um, to a, a precision of one. Um, but a better way to round sometimes is if you just always wanna round up or always wanna round down. I've seen people go through some very strange formulas to get there because they don't know about what are called ceilings and floors. So basically a ceiling will take you to the nearest number above and a floor will take you to the nearest number below. Um, so they can be quite handy as well. So it's good to not forget about them. So now we're going to look at um, sequences of numbers and how we can sort of deal with these. So we're sort of using lists in this portion of the script, um, but we won't go too deep into what a list is and how to manage it. That will be a part of a later tutorial that we run where we actually get more in detail on how to work with lists and do a lot more complex things with them. But basically a sequence of numbers expects a start, how many things you want and the space between them. So obviously this will give me uh, the starting number of one, it'll, I'll have nine items and they're all separated by one. So obviously I get a list of nine elements in this case, separated by one. Um, I've also ran another function on the back here called remap, which basically takes a list of numbers and it remaps them to uh, a new minimum and maximum value. So you can see here I've remapped them between zero and one, in which case um, you end up with uh, a remapped list here that you can see. If you hover over this corner of nodes, you'll usually be able to pin or unpin a list, or if you just hover over it, you can temporarily look at it um, if you don't want to use a watch node. So um, you can see here that basically it's given me that range instead. So that can be quite handy for things like percentages. If you want to convert something to what percentage of an overall list's maximum or minimum value it is. Um, you could also remap it to 255, for example, to get RGB codes. So if I make that 255, Obviously I'm going to get values between zero and 55 instead um, at the same proportion that they were before. Likewise, um, we can also sum the total of a list and get the combined value of all the numbers in that list. So we can also take what's called a range, um, which I find is usually more useful, which is basically a start number, an end number and a step. In this case, I've fed one input into two. Into two. So you can see I've used one twice. So you can use numbers more than once in certain nodes. Um, and obviously this will give me again, the same type of list, but built in a different way. 
So I could say that I finished at 15 and obviously my list will grow to suit that range. And from here, um, you can also run an average function, for example, to find the overall average number in that list. Um, so that can be quite handy as well. So we're gonna quickly look at operators as well. Um, so these are more or less things that will determine uh, a true or a false condition. So you've got um, equals and does not equal. So obviously five does not equal three. So the output will be true. If I say five and five, obviously that output is now false. So that's just a way to check a condition, which then you can then feed into another statement after. We've also got greater than or less than. So same thing again, obviously if it's equal, it will always be false because it has to be greater or less. Um, you can see here, obviously five is greater than three. So it's true three, uh, five is not less than three. So that's false. Um, but then you've also got greater, greater or equal or less than or equal. So in this case, five and five give me true either way. Whereas obviously I get the same result for a non-equal number. So we're going to look at logic now. So that was sort of a, I guess, touching on the concept of logic or what we call booleans in Dynamo. So a boolean is an input type. So in your main list up here, you'll find that you can get a boolean under input, basic, and there it is, it's true or a false, and they're just a radio box. So as you toggle them, they change their output. Um, so true and false. And then you can also do not if you want to turn a true into a false. So say your statement's going to give you a whole bunch of trues and you need the trues to be false because maybe you're running them through a, a mask on one of your lists to say, take all the false statements. Um, so obviously that would just always be the opposite of whatever it is. Um, these are quite useful. So anyone that's done code based logic before will probably be familiar with and not and or. So in this case, this is and, so everything has to be true in order to, to result overall in a true statement. So obviously if one thing is false, it comes out false. Um, or, so at least one of these has to be true. So in this case, if all of them were false, I'd get a false. But if at least one of them is true, I'll get a true when you combine them together. And these can basically be grown or reduced um, to suit how many booleans you need. And note that if I, if my list is too long, I end up with a null, which is basically a, a piece of data that doesn't work. So it does need to equal the number of inputs going in. And there's also XOR, so is only one is true. So in this case, obviously there's only one value that's true here, so I'll get a true outcome. But if they're both true, it will give me a, a rejection. So that can be quite handy as well. So there are ways to handle true false statements. Um, you can convert units as well. So there's a conversion section for how to deal with this. And I believe that's under math as well. Uh, I think it's under units. Yes. So there's a few conversion tools um, that, that it's quite a handy node. You can basically pick what type you want to deal with length, area or volume. And depending which one you pick, you've got a whole bunch of units that you can deal with from there either side. And you can also flip the units depending which way you're rounding. So these can be quite helpful. For example, that's my height in centimeters. So now I know what my height is in feet. Um, likewise, you can convert area and also volume. So they can be quite helpful too. So obviously 10,000 square meters equals one hectare. You can also convert degrees to radians. Um, if you're familiar with trigonometry, you'll understand uh, the importance of radians versus degrees and when you need to work with them. You can see here, I've also called out a constant, which is pi. So pi is actually available as a node. Um, which is really helpful because obviously you don't want to type out pi every time you need it. I believe that pi is stored under functions at the bottom, along with a few other constants. So it's obviously got other constants like E, the golden ratio, and pi times two. So you could obviously just take pi and multiply it by two with a function, but this packages it a little bit more and means it's, it's quicker for us to write a function that involves trigonometry and circles and pi. So you can see here in this case, I'm converting it to 180 degrees and the opposite here, I'm converting 180 degrees into pi. So obviously I could call on my equals statement in this case to see if these are equal. So I can say, does my output equal pi? And it does, it's true. In this case, I could say, okay, 150 degrees. Okay, well, that's not pi. So you can see there just how a, a true false statement could be put into the middle of something like this. Okay, um, so that's pretty much all the nodes for here. Probably the last one I'll just touch on, which I haven't set up, but is, is useful to know about is the if node. Um, so anyone that's done coding or Excel will probably understand if then else logic. So if this is certain, a certain condition is true, do this, otherwise do that. So 
the, the reason why I've sort of touched on this last is because it's in a custom package now. Um, since version two, uh, the if function in Dynamo by default doesn't work anymore. I find it will typically not give uh, the correct result. However, a package called Zebra does have a core if function that works here. So basically this will validate. So the way this works is obviously I take a Boolean and this is basically my condition. And I've got one outcome if true and one if false. So it's not purely like an if then else statement. It's sort of the other way around. It's going, I'm gonna get one of two outcomes. So it doesn't do everything that you need. But in this case, we could take a, a number such as five and we could take a number such as 10. So I was doing a clone there. So when you select a node, if you hold down control and click, it creates a clone. So if it's true, it's five. If it's false, it's 10. And if I just look at my output there, you'll see as I toggle that, my output changes. So you can use this node to feed different results into scripts depending on certain conditions. So that can be quite helpful as well. Um, but otherwise, that's pretty much the tutorial um, for, for this session. Uh, but feel free to join me in the next one. And if you need any help beyond this, I always recommend looking at the Dynamo Primer and also the Dynamo Forums if you have any uh, more detailed questions that need a, a specific answer. And of course, feel free to leave comments down below and ask questions as well. In our next lesson, we'll be looking at strings um, or text and other types of data such as color. So feel free to join me on that one if you're enjoying what you're seeing so far and if you're learning a lot. And uh, I'll see you in the next lesson. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye.